okay. So I'm just gonna um, start it. Well, I think we're being so brave, to be honest. Like we've been, you know, week after week, we've been tackling really difficult, uh, difficult subjects, and and you guys are still very keen to know what's happening. I'm so excited. <laughs> all right, so. So today, we're all going to go to the beginning. Today, we're going to look at an appraisal framework in linguistics. And uh, this is um, sort of a direct wing from the systemic functional linguistics that we've had a look at last week. And the appraisal framework is, it is an extension of the linguistic theories that Michael Halliday put to, into place. So um, it has emerged over time and mostly based on the research that is done here in Australia. So this particular framework, it's our Australian baby. It is used all over the world, but this is where it started. Remember last week we talked about the um, linguistics and there are two schools of thought in relation to the um, linguistics that some believe that linguistics are the branch of psychology and some believe that linguistics are the branch of sociology because language like a behavior uh, can be indicative of emotion and intent, uh, truth, fal falsity, and we can see it in a textual um, medium as well. Um, so many and many falsely mistake perception as reality and we can have a look at it. This is exactly what it is all about. So appraisal framework is going to work with the perception of the writer or speaker. We're only going to talk about writers because we'll only be dealing with the written text. And language also has its uh, cultural context from social interactions. So while language is shaped by the individual psychology, we do have a social layer to our language and meaning. Well, and uh, let's have a look then on the psychology behind the appraisal framework. So in psychology, um, so appraisal theory actually takes its root in psychology and it says that emotion extracted from our evaluation or appraisal or when we estimate uh, of effects of the cause of people, events, whatever. So we all inherently have a reaction to everything. There is nothing in this world that we take as neutral there is always a little bit of a tint of color of emotion. So essentially, our appraisal, our uh, evaluation of situations or things always have an affective response. That's what psychology says. So for example, this is a textbook example, going on a first date. For some people, it's a positive event. Uh, when people go on a first date, they think um, they're happy, there is an emotion of joy, anticipation, there might be some long lasting, you know, effect of this, oh, I might get married, I might get, uh, you know, engaged. And on another hand, that same idea of a first date in another people could have a completely different reaction. You know, if you mention a first date to someone, people start feeling dejected and sad and empty because the long lasting effect is, mm, I'm not going to get married ever. So, and the, the difference here is in a perception because the first date, the idea of a first date is the same, but the reaction to it, uh, the, it to different people is different. So, and the important aspect of the appraisal theory in psychology is that it accounts for individual variability. 
each one of us will have a variation in uh, reactions to the same event. So, back to the, you know, the, the notion of psychology. So if in, um, sorry, in sociology. So if in psychology, the appraisal theory says that emotions evoked by our evaluation cause a specific reaction in different people, the notion of social appraisal adds a social dimension. So this means that in appraisal theory, when we add a social dimension, it says the way an individual appraises the event influences, influenced um, how other individual appraise or feel about the same event. So if in psychology we're two ducks and I feel this way and you feel that way, in sociology could be many ducks that feel this way and they teach their children and their neighbors and their sisters to react to the same thing in the same way so the social aspect is in psychology we have our own reaction in sociology we spread this reaction to other people and it's very common example here is that there are freedom fighters and terrorists, very often they're the same people, but the perception paints them different color depending on which group of people we belong to. If they're fighting for the freedom of my country, I call them freedom fighters. If they're fighting against the troops of my country that are trying to take over, they're terrorists. And that's why that's where the appraisal framework works in psychology and in sociology. So for the appraisal framework, even though it takes its root in a systemic functional linguistics that believes that language is a social issue, it brings the psychology on board. Now we're going to go to something very familiar. Do you remember the sign? <laughs> yes, how can we forget? And the sign started back in with Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And what I think is my own thing. No one can take the think of me, what I think of. So that's where we have a notion of meta language. What I think is not a, I don't think in language. I think in images and cats and ideas. So that's why we've got in, ling in linguistics, uh, Monsieur Sosu uh, gave us a really good idea. So we've got a signifier and a signified. We see the word, our mind provides us the picture. The signifier is what we see, the signified is the idea. And then Jesus asked us a very good question. Why is there the third thing? Isn't that enough? I see a cat. My, my mind provides me a picture of the cat. That should be enough. Why do we need a referent? Ha <laughs> ha! Now we're coming to it. Because shouldn't that be enough, you know? We say white elephant, our mind, white elephant. We say cat, a cat, a flower, a flower. Oh, why do we need a separate entity? But what we need a separate entity for is to know how we feel about it and what the actual referent is for us. Because some people see a cat and they have an idea of a cat and their mind provides them a very nice picture of a fluffy tabby cat that sits on their lap and does its really nice vibration thing. For some people, there would be an image of a wild cat 
that eats birds in a garden. Hmm, that might not be the same color. So as we've learned from Saussure, independently of our wish, our mind evaluates the signifier, what we see, provides us the signified, the idea of what we see, but it also, using our own perception, colors the sign emotionally. So we never have a neutral sign. The sign, the signifier and signified, will always have a referent to help us know how we feel about it. There are some things we don't have emotion towards, but it's still not going to be neutral unless it's a thing we don't know about or we don't know what it is. Very often, then the referent, I don't know what it is, will give us a little bit of a tummy ache <laughs> or, or we'll feel a little bit nauseous. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So even if we don't have a clear referent, the emotion was still going to be there. So that's the beginning of our wonderful journey into an appraisal. So now, as we talked before, that uh, language can be indicative of emotion. So, and many falsely take perceived, um, the preconceived perception as truth. So now we share our perceptions of events with others. I can have a preconceived idea and I share it with my child, I share it with neighbors, anyone, uh, anyone who comes in contact with me who is a part of my group, my bubble. It doesn't have to be that we all speak English and we have the same preconceived idea, which in a lot of sense we do. But even within English, we can have little groups where we have a different feelings to the same referent. And as a group, then we can share. Cat lovers, they have a good feeling to the referent of a cat. People that are not very happy with cats, they have a different feeling, even though we share a language. So appraisal comes in to understand how the individual feeling colors um, the group feeling or how, why the group feeling is uh, uh, how the group feeling is influenced by individual or how it can influence the individual back if the individual thought i don't like cats very much but the person is in the cat lover group they do have power to change the sign color so this is this is where appraisal comes from and appraisal is a, a science that only describes so it doesn't doesn't offer solutions. Appraisal is for us, especially for us as uh, translators, people who work with text. Uh, appraisal is a framework that would help us understand where the writer sits. So what color uh, is the writer's reference are colored, basically. So now let's have a look at a wider picture. Hmm. So we have an appraisal framework to help describe and explain uh, the way language is used to evaluate, adopt stances, construct textual personas, and manage relationships manage interpersonal positionings and relationships. So if we have a look at, we know that there is a social aspect to the uh, framework, we can now from knowing the beginning of our um, appraisal uh, framework, we can uh, see how writers or speakers pass judgment and how they can pass judgment on people generally. It's uh, actually a very broad term. Nobody passes 
judgments on people generally. There is always a group that is targeted. Um, they can pass judgments on other writers. They can pass judgments on material objects. Uh, they can pass judgments on events happening, affairs, states of states of affairs, and so on. But what they can do as well, when they when they take a stance of past judgment, they can start forming alliances. So in the textual, even in a textual environment, the person that writes, he he can um, inadvertently assign himself to a particular group. And in the text, the way he speaks, we can see that he aligns himself with his himself within a group and that within that group, he's got allies. Also, he says, also he behaves as if he does. So while we can form, uh, we can identify how the writers form alliances, we can also identify how writers distance themselves from people that they have decided they are not allied with. So um, in a social aspect, this is, this, is, this is the social aspect of the uh, appraisal uh, framework. The influence that we pass, that the writers pass on to other people. And for us as, as translators, it's one of those things, as, as we spoke about it last week, we do it inherently. We don't, we don't even know what it's called. And it's very rare we know the name, the scientific name of a particular judgment that's been passed. But we understand by reading the text that the writer belongs to a particular group. He believes he belongs to a particular group. He believes he is not alone there. And he believes that there are people that oppose this group or don't belong to it. So we know it in our bones as, as a, a language carriers. Um, so another part in an appraisal framework is that we don't only explore the judgments, but we also explore the volume of those judgments and how it says. So we explore attitude, judgments, and emotive responses. But we also look at, are they explicitly presented in texts? Or are they a little bit more indirectly implied? Are they presupposed? Are they assumed? Remember how we, we looked at this um, convention last week with the, some things we just accept because they are, we don't have a logical explanation. So we've got an arbitrary view on something and then we've got a conventional view. So this is where our appraisal framework helps us to identify those things. Are these people speak like this because they assume that this is a common knowledge or is this a presupposed thing? Do we as readers, do we belong to the group they approach or do we belong to an opposite group? So how do we, by reading the text, we can measure a temperature of the writer and of the reader. So, and another thing, uh, appraisal framework gives us um, a tool to carefully measure and carefully manage um, to, to, to take into account that the speaker might possibly have an opposition. The speaker might possibly have a reader who holds an opposite view. So how do they manage this with language? Um, we'll have quite a few examples later on. So the appraisal framework, it consists of three major um, sub arms. Uh, one of them is huge. Number one, attitudinal positioning. So this is about the position of a speaker. And overall appraisal framework um, covers all, all terms. So 
because we're going to evaluate we can evaluate all language with the appraisal um, framework because we can identify with appraisal framework we can identify uh, the tools of the language by which writers show us their position their stance so they we can see how writers negotiate their stances within the potential respondents as well it's a very interesting show it's like uh, reading a text sometimes it's just like watching a, um, an action movie i mean if you do it from through the prism of appraisal framework so according to the appraisal the evaluative use of language performs following functions so attitudinal positioning we also know it as praising and blaming Boo. so by using attitudinal positioning we just segment the area where writers indicate either a positive or negative assessment and it could be about anything people places things happening and states of affair and remember how we said in systemic functional linguistics we don't assess words in systemic functional linguistics we assess the units of meaning and appraisal framework uh, obviously adopts the same view we're going to assess the whole utterance the whole passage the whole text and within that text we will see different temperatures temperature rising temperature dropping the writer is uh, profusely opposed to something and a writer is quite judgmental and very loud and not you know uh, covert at all about some things or he's very very explicit about some things and some writers they and then the writer would drop into a different topic into a different uh, uh, whatever whatever topic maybe, maybe he is not so um, sure of or he is not an expert in that particular field we could see that the language would change a little bit and become a little bit more subtle so another item here is uh, dial we call it the dialogic so dialogical positioning so this is a verbal communication but it's in the written form so it is primarily a matter of self-expression and uh, the person that externalized their thoughts outside so we either again remember we spoke about the tenor field and mode and this is one of those tenors where the writer would have uh, initially will have a relationship with a reader and from from this we can we can build up a little system where we can have a look at the appraisal how does this writer feels about the group of people he belongs to how the writer feels about the people he's talking to how the writer feels about other writers so when we talk about um, the dialogue it it could be a very um, meekly colored it would be a um, a textbook or a report where seemingly no room for emotions however using the appraisal framework we will always find them and the last one is an intertextual positioning so under inter intertextual positioning we just look at places where writers use other people's work to support uh, their point of view or to not support to endorse or not endorse it so this is when writers that's why we call it a, a reference or quote so in, in intertextual positioning it's a part of a, a, of a dialogue so when we have my own dialogue and then I take someone else's and I and I include it as somebody else's thought uh, it is a very very cool device but we will we can always use our judgment to see why did the writer take this particular quote we can still measure even if the original writer meant had a, a completely different mood and temperature for it 
the person that took it for the intertextual positioning might use it for something else. You know how we say, we have a saying, out of context. So this is a very good example where some things could be taken so far out of context and the new speaker can change the, the color, the emotional meaning of the initial writer had and, will, and has the power then to influence in, uh, on a social level other people with this new view. Um, so within the attitude, so attitude is one of the biggest parts of um, uh, appraisal framework because within the attitudes, as we, as we talked about before, so first of all, I can have a judgment. I can have a few different versions of judgment. I can have a, a target of my judgment. I could be uh, directing it at myself. I could be directing it at other people. Um, it could be quite loud or it could be a little bit subdued. So it could be explicit and implicit. Um, then again, with the confidence, it could be a, the confidence as a scale with which the author might employ a particular device. Um, and within the first, the attitudinal positioning, so as, because we've got three, they're the main three we use to, um, to identify the uh, effect, judgment, or appreciation. So within the attitude, we can have three different views. I guess for us as translators, especially because we, we work as translators within a particular field and the, the tenor is more or less the same, there's either expert talking to other experts or um, a compliance, com compliance body is talking to, to uh, individuals or bodies that needs to comply. So we, we have, I think, working in Kamala, those, those things are already in our blood. So reading a particular text, we can pretty much take the temperature and use the correct correct um, attitude uh, straight away. But it is possible that at some stage, this particular um, um, framework, the appraisal framework, might be of help if we move into translating something else for, for, for something else. It could be a textbook, it could be a, a report, it could be an emotional piece about um, some species are uh, disappearing or something. So uh, for me personally, as a translator, uh, I find this area of um, structural uh, functional linguistic, systemic functional linguistic, very, very helpful for me. Maybe because I'm also Russian and I like graphs and I like when everything has a name <laughs> and I can, you know, put a little, little ticks over it. Um, so the, the area is quite large, but we'll just have a look at one little bit. So within the attitude, we have affect. And uh, affect, we also call it an emotion. Um, this is an evaluation by means of the writer indicating how they're emotionally disposed to whatever, a person, thing or happening. So when when we see we see effect is when we clearly understand how the writer feels about what he's talking about so i love jazz so giving a few examples here i love jazz this new proposal by the government terrifies me so we can we can separate this new proposal by the government because there is actually an emotion, an emotion there as well but we're just gonna take terrifies me as a very clear indication where the writer is. We have next one is ethical, as ethical appraisal, it's a judgment. So in a judgment, 
why is it ethical too, is because normative assessment of human behavior in this instance, typically they make reference to the rules or conventions of behavior. So that's where we look at the arbitrary and conventional um, pulling strings within our mind. So some things we collectively accept as, as a convention, as a norm. And that's where judgment come from. Judgment come from. So some things we read, especially if it's from an olden time, and it's just a constatation of facts, but because we live in the 21st century, we have a very sharp emotion about some text because we read it at a different time. We read it from a different point of view and from a different convention. People at that time wouldn't have the same, the same judgment. So I've got an example here is that he corruptly agreed to accept money for those build, for the biddings and the contract. So we have passed a judgment regardless of what the what the actual thing happened they say he corruptly agreed to do this so she, she sneakily went into my room yeah so in my mind i have a story i forbade her to come into my room and she did and she, i wasn't there i was there but i didn't see her she sneaked she i've got a judgment this is my room this is my kingdom <laughs> yeah i have a convention about it um, and the last point here in uh, attitude and attitudinal assessment and positioning is the appreciation. And we call it an aesthetical uh, uh, positioning. So we've got an effect where a person passes the, um, passes the idea of how he feels to us quite clearly. We've got judgment where a person passes our idea to us clearly. And then we've got an appreciation and aesthetic, which is very similar to judgment because it's got to do with something that uh, possesses a quality. Um, so the appreciation, it's an assessment of the form, of appearance, composition, uh, significance, impact. So something, so it's not a human behavior. So it's something that we do a reference to aesthetics and other systems of social value. There are many arguments here that, wait a second, things that we think beautiful, obviously unite us as a group. Many of us think that sunset is beautiful because it is in our culture. There are some cultures that wouldn't give a fig about sunset and how beautiful it is because it's just not in their culture, it's not in their convention. Or when we say um, about the work of art, some work of art for a group of people who were conditioned from an early age to say this is beautiful, will then have this convention and say this, this picture is beautiful. And I would say I'm not, this is my appreciation of aesthetic, but um, it has been built as being a part of a society and be, being part of the convention. Although art is the area where we feel quite at liberty to say I like it or I don't like it, but there are other things that we conventionally think they are beautiful. Um, so I've got a few, I've got a few examples, but I think the most important difference here is that I am uh, taking a view of the objective, as objective as possible observer, and I say, and I, and I describe something rather than judge it. So it's a very shaky area in, um, in appraisal framework. I have to say, in appraisal framework, there's many shaky, <laughs> shaky areas where linguists come in every day and then slam the door and they say that is not so, sir. I would not agree to that in a million years. So, and the, and the grammarians at war. 
Um, our next, next thing we have is our dialogue. So within the dialogue, we have a position as well. So when the uh, writer, when we talk about uh, a conversation, um, we normally can understand pretty quickly which side of the street the, the speaker or the writer is. So the writer's positions in terms of dialogue have been classified from the point of engagement. Uh, so an engagement as influence. Um, so in, in this particular area of the appraisal framework, we're concerned with the diverse range of resources by which writers adjust and negotiate the arguability of whatever they say. So this is, strictly speaking, just a mitigation, damage control. And in a dialogic positioning, that's mostly what we're concerned with, is how well uh, writers do their damage control. So we've got, that, that's why it's called an engagement. So how, how well we engage or not engaged. We've got key engagement resources. And one of them is called disclaim. And within disclaim, we've got uh, denial and counter expectation. Because expectation is come under a different positioning. And uh, uh, within denial, we've got things that we immediately see the denial. This action won't damage the trust between the president and his bodyguard. So no, we, we, we can see the device that the writer uses when he uses a denial. Um, there in a the disclaim, we've got one more, the counter expectation is when, we, uh, when they use it, this particular device of throwing us a little bit off. So it's not as pronounced as a denial. So amazingly, or bizarrely, this damage the trust between the president and his bodyguard. So it goes against our expectation. We, um, we thought it will, or we thought it, it would not. Um, next positioning here is the proclaim. This is an expectation, and we can, we can see the expectation within the text. This action will, of course, damage the trust between the president. Um, we also have the pronouncement in here where it says, well, I contend that the action will damage trust or the fact of the matter are that the blah, 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 will blah, blah, blah. So this is something that we do not negotiate where um, in and, and negotiation is the part, is the, the major part of the engagement. We either negotiate or we don't negotiate. We are loud and clear or we're quiet and subtle about it. But it's all about how, where we sit. Are we sit front and center? Do we sit a little bit to the left? Are we feeling confident about our position or not? And when I say we, as, as a writers and us as um, doing a text analysis, we come across it and we say, I'm not sure he knows what he's talking about or he positions himself like he's like slippery as an eel and he speaks in a manner that you don't even know. Where does he sit? He just said one thing and then he changed and then... So, and, and the last thing here is probability. So within the probabilities of engagement, uh, we have three things. We've got evidence, likelihood and hearsay where evidence is the most confident, likelihood is, the, I guess so, and hearsay is, um, they say, but I don't know whether I trust them or not. So, and by using a particular linguistic devices, we can, using our matrix of the appraisal framework, we can identify where on a scale of probabilities they actually sit. 
So with evidences, it seems that, yeah, I, I, I concur, uh, likelihood is it may, and hearsay is I hear that, or it is said, or it is believed. And this is, these are the instruments that the writer would employ for us to know. I don't think he's very confident in here. And as as translators, then we can move this particular intent onto another language. Mm, I'm not really, I can see that the writer is not confident, so I need to translate that mood into another language. And the intertextual positioning is the quoting or the reference. Um, so we just call it the, the relevance or a reference is an attribution and endorsement. <clears throat> so within attribution and endorsement, there are many, many little subcategories that come out of it um, where the main idea is, is the writer judging positively or negatively whatever is being said, whatever he's quoting and uh, tries to, in, and, and we also measure how confident is the writer in, in quoting whatever is being said. So the devices that um, the writers use here are, he punctures, he shows, he demonstrates. Um, they could use the devices that we've just seen from the previous slide in terms of denial or you know, expectation, counter expectations. So they can say, or oh, bizarrely, he shows blah, blah, blah. Where I just read it and I thought it wasn't bizarre, but now I'm reading the, um, the a, a reference or, or, or a critical um, summary. And I see that, oh, this author actually doesn't agree with what being said. So I, as a social being, my, my referent, is starting to change color maybe, or, or stay the same color. Um, so after we've seen all this, I want us to have a look at one thing. Um, so this is, this is an interview. I haven't heard the interview, but I've, I've read it in a written form. And this is an interview with John Howard. He was the prime minister at the time. It's 1999. Uh, I was in Australia, but I understood that that was the time where there was a lot of unrest in terms of our big four banks. And the you know, public has been outraged that at the, in the year where banks have done, have made the biggest profit, they raised their, uh, their service fees. And this is this guy he's interviewing. So this is, this is a dialogue. And uh, we're looking at the way how this particular speaker is trying to cover all bases and mitigate the damages. So um, the, the dialogic aspect is very subtle. So um, I'm just gonna have a look, I'm just gonna have a look. What was his name? So basically the, the, the position is following. So this is an extract from the radio interview. And the interviewer is Quizzes, the prime minister at the time, uh, about the behavior of the Australian banks in raising interest rates at the time where they have been making a record profit. So. Prime Minister John Howard, he is a conservative right wing individual and he is in favor of free markets. So he can be then expected to be supportive of the, you know, or maybe he is reluctant to criticize the banks. So because the banks are his economic powerhouses and he is behind them. So now this guy is saying, there is an argument though, is there? The banks have been a bit greedy. I mean, the profits are high and good on them. Um, they're entitled to have high profits. But at the same time, the fees are bordering on the unreasonable now.
So the interviewer, as a, as a writer, as as a, well as a speaker, he had to assess the situation from all from all points. He has a view, but because he's speaking to a powerful person, um, he has to follow a convention of um, social compatibility. He is most probably hired by a station that is not outrageously left. So he, he wants an answer. He wants to see how this person is feeling about this outrage. There is an outrage out there. People are saying, are you kidding us? We're just from the fire into the anvil. You guys are raising interest rates. The, the salaries are like the salaries uh, hasn't, haven't been reassessed for ages and you had the biggest profits and you're raising interest rate. Are you crazy? What has the prime minister got to say about that? But he doesn't, uh, he doesn't ask that question that way. He asks us in a manner that there is an argument though, is there as if, as if it is removed from him a little bit. There is an argument somewhere there, not in this room. I just heard it. So th there, is, there is an argument though, is there? Like a, something like a hearsay. So the confidence, because we've had a look at the confidence levels in our uh, dialogic position and the engagement position, we can see that we can see the devices that guy, this guy used to make sure that the, the damages are mitigated in a way he's constructed his, his sentence. And uh, this is a, a prime and a perfect example of our appraisal framework and how we can use it. So the banks have been a bit greedy. That's a convention. He's passing a judgment on something that we all think what greedy is not an arbitrary con concept. We know what greedy means. I mean, the profits are high and good on them. They're entitled, but so we've got this, we've got this 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 statement that has the appraisal framework um, sort of displayed in all its beauty where we've got a personal affect. I mean, I mean, they're, they're good and high. I, I have an opinion, I mean. Then we have, they say, I say, uh, we feel <laughs> unreasonable. The fees are unreasonable. They're bordering on the unreasonable. Unreasonable is not a very strong word. If you border on unreasonable, it's not really an outrage but this is what he's trying to say. So as a, as a, as a taste of, um, of appraisal, I thought you would really enjoy this. Well, a question, and maybe, maybe it's a question for Gillian here. Uh, when, when it says, when it reads, the profits are high and good on them, what's, how do you read that on? What, what's with that use of, of a preposition? I'm not Gillian, Gillian. but I, I, oh, sorry. I can't hear you, Gillian. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's good on them. It's like, yeah. uh, it's actually, a, it's basically saying, well, okay, if they can do that, that's, you know, that's good for them. Um, good on, you can say good on you for doing yeah. that. It's a yeah. sort of an approval. Um, but in this case, good on them if they can if they can get a high profit, you know, if they can oh, okay as yeah. they want, yeah, okay, very well, yeah. So you know that that's um, so so good. Price. Good doesn't quali. Sorry, I read it at first as good qualifying the profits, but it's no. not. No. The profits are high, no. profits comma, are high. and good on them, and yeah, good on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay. right. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Olga Thank didn't you. read it quite um, quite as, as he meant, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah. So he, he said the profits are high and good on them. So good on the banks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Which, yeah. Which again, using uh, using the appraisal framework, good on them. Is it uh, is it uh, is it actually a, a good judgment or? Well, could yeah. be. It's approving. It is. It, it is. is. It is approving. But on the other yeah. hand, well, good on good on you if you can you know, get as much money out of people as you want. Good mm. on you, you know. Mm. Um, so it can actually be used a little bit negatively, but... Uh, not in this case, I don't think, because then it says they're entitled to have high profits. Mm -hmm. So I think, the, you know, it goes with the good on them. Yes, yeah. but, it's, uh, but, it, but as, as um, Olga says, this... In trying to not antagonize the person he's um, interviewing, he's going up and down and up and down, you know, down into the greedy and good on you, they're entitled to have high profits, but at the same time, so it's, it's sort of like a wave. It's quite interesting. Yes, very good. Because he's wow. here, he's representing a community. He's asking a question from the point of view as a community, but he distances himself a little bit from that community. Yeah. There is an argument. I mean, he, he says that there is an argument, but then he says, I mean, hey, and whoa. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a really, this is very, very beautiful social concept to have a look at how it works in, in text. And us as, as professionals that work with text, uh, the appraisal framework, if, if there are some questions sometimes and we can't understand what the hell is the writer saying, the, the appraisal framework and the systemic functional analysis would be a perfect tool. So we do all this inherently, we do it anyway, especially you guys who've been on a field of translating for years and years and years. But there is still an underlying science. If ever in doubt, we can always go and, and uh, have a matrix for a text analysis from either of those systems that would help us to, uh, to understand the intent and understand the meaning of, of the right to get into his shoes. And, and as you can see, uh, we all have slightly different interpretations of some of those phrases. So you know, as, as to how far left or right this, this interviewer is. Absolutely. And as we should, this, um, these frameworks, they're not set in stone. This is a very, very fluid concept. So it's like a, a spectrum. Mm. We've got this, you know, endorsement spectrum. How, how influential is the saying? We've got this, uh, a part of affect. Uh, I love ice cream, or I can't live without ice cream. Both of them saying that I uh, have a very positive attitude towards ice cream, but it is on a, on a scale. So in everything that we see or hear, we not, not only pass it through the eyes of a writer, we pass it through our own eyes. And however impartial we try to be as translators, we unfortunately can't get, we can't translate through somebody else's head unless we use a machine translation. All right, so this is our summary. So for today, the, uh, the evaluation, our, so all our attitudinal positioning, our endorsements, <coughs> everything that we've, we've looked at in um, appraisal framework <coughs> is designed to help us describe a few things and evaluate uh, from from the framework that is presented so we'll have a look at the differences in the writer style writer style so is it more or less defined like what what are they talking about are they because we can then identify are they experts or they're just blubbers as people who work with text, we can we can apply the tactics from our appraisal framework to to bring them to into the clear waters, mm. to look into their soul. Yeah, um, 
so we can also have a look at the different language constructs that the writers employ for us to measure the temperature and to see how are they disposed to whatever they say. Uh, we can have a look at the different assumptions from the point of view of their beliefs. Because as, as the translators, we, it's, it's hard to uh, not to take um, into account our own beliefs when we look at someone else's writing. Because when we translate, we need to remember who do we translate for? What are their beliefs? So when we look, when we take a writer and we'll, we'll, we'll look at whatever writer is saying through the appraisal framework, it helps us then pass it on to the audience that is intended or unintended. And we can use our own linguistic devices to, to, to deliver the meaning. Um, so uh, as you can see, all those, um, the systemic functional linguistics and the appraisal framework as a part of it, it's all a part of the bigger subject of a discourse analysis. So when we do a text analysis, we, we do have so many devices to identify the, the meaning from, from many levels. As we looked at the register last week with the tenor field and mode, today we've had a look that the referent might have a paramount influence over the writer and over reader and over the translator. And we can, we can go back to those models and select the one that works the best in a particular context from the, um, you know, through the framework that's available. It makes our job a little bit easier from time to time. Oh, well, that was it for today, folks. This is all hips and hips of reading. <laughs> And the end. Hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. What Brilliant. You that was, that was so interesting. That was great. Oh, oh I'm pleased. Oh. I feel sometimes that might be a little bit too boring. No. No, that was not boring at all. No. Mm. And I guess you make it not boring. You know, you're a really good presenter. It's just amazing. Mm. I'm so pleased. Well, if, if you guys see something interesting and you see, if you read something and think, oh, this is going to be a really good example for, you know, for the appraisal, I should save this text and send it to Olga and see what she says and let's talk about it over morning tea. Well, it's, yeah, interesting. I, it, it's interesting because um, although, as you say, in our report texts, all the uh, the fire and and fun is is sort of blunted out of it. There are still underlying currents that, and and sometimes if we haven't been in the meeting, we're not quite sure exactly what those currents are. It's not as clear as it might be. But after years of um, of working here, we sort of know the antagonisms and the. It's, it can be interesting to actually sit in the meeting and see people's faces. I can see an Eastern Spine Bill now. But anyway, that's only out the window. <laughs> well, I read it in this report this year where uh, Russians want to change something and use different gear. They want everyone to use the same gear for the same research yep. project where it was already previously decided it is not a problem. And I've seen the word unreasonable. Yes, yes. Yes. So, and that is perfect for appraisal framework. There is an emotion in there. Sure, in it sure official is. official report. Yeah, yeah. And there, there's the, all the subtleties, you know, when we talk about, you know, we try to put a country name in saying they oppose and then <gasps> we, we go through all members, some members, one member. Oh, you know, they yes. will not have one member. It has to be some members and, and all of that. And when we have quotes from Russia, the English in those quotes is so bad, but because they are a quote, we just stick it in quotes and leave it. And that is, you know, that is, we fix 
sometimes we can just subtly but you know normally we just don't touch them because they are a quote and and that looks just terrible for some non-english speaking countries having their statements in english in there so it's you know little subtleties but it is there mm. Mm. it's quite interesting mm. <laughs> oh I've just oh, lost yeah. connection so that's our appraisal okay mm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. I'm so pleased.